got Sig Gibbon, and I'm here with Danny. We're going to be discussing a little bit of philosophy of biology today. And um, it's going to be an interesting one. This isn't usually the kind of content I do on this channel, but I think since philosophy kind of underlies all of inquiry, it's important to include anytime we're discussing biology or science in general. And uh, Danny's the philosophy guy around here, so we got him on for this. Um, we're going to be using a text titled Philosophy of Biology by Godfrey and Smith as our framework here. We're just going to kind of be chatting about it. So uh, Danny, how about you like introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about philosophy? Yeah, I'm Danny, and thanks for having me, Erica. Um, so I'm a grad student um, getting my master's in philosophy. I already have a bachelor's degree in philosophy. I teach philosophy on the high school level. I love it. Um, so um, thanks for having me on. Uh, when, someone, <laughs> when someone asks me, what is philosophy? Because I get that question often. Um, I, it's so hard to answer the question, right? But um, there's a couple ways you can think about it, and you kind of get, you got it like the heart of it, right? Like, one can think of philosophy as asking the big questions, right? Um, I think there's a, the, the author mentions a guy named Wilford Sellers that kind of frames philosophy in this way, where we're asking questions um, on sort of the outer rim, like the broad questions, like, well, what is there? Um, you know, do I exist? You know, those, those sorts of, what's the meaning of life? That, that, that sort of, those sorts of questions, right? How things but, hang together, I think is how he first. Right, right. Yeah, that's how his sellers put it. And um, I'm going to use an analogy because I, I'm probably talking to a lot of scientists and not a lot of people that have really investigated philosophy. So I'm going to use an, an analogy. So in, in engineering, in, in, in engineering, you know, you're using raw materials and what you know in science to like fix a problem maybe adjust it, you know, kind of like make sure that the structure is all sound and stuff. Well, we kind of do that in philosophy too, but not on like a raw material based. We do it with our thoughts, with our concepts, with our beliefs, right? So we think about like, oh, what do we mean by, let's say, what do we mean by the word life? Mm -hmm. When something is alive, what do we mean by that? And we entertain, well, you know, it had, there's homeostasis involved um, and there's reproduction involved. And we give these lists, right? And the second that you start doing that, you're actually kind of doing philosophy. You're analyzing your concept, right? And you might come to something like, oh, well, that can't be true, right? Because if we think life in this way, then computers are life, right? So, you, you know, what you're doing there is that kind of deliberative process of like really getting your concepts straight and make sure they all go here in this nice little package, right? It's and of course, criteria, yeah. right? That's inherently philosophical is saying, okay, this list of criteria is what we will use when we're discussing, as you mentioned, life and i think that i think that's a great way of putting it it, it really is yeah. the pieces of the whole yeah like there's um there's a and then there's a, like a third way so we have like the questions right with the big inquiry right with the inquiries and then we have like the engineering analogy where we're like doing conceptual engineering right and then there's the, i think a third one which pertains to what we're doing here is that we we can think of philosophy as what we say um what we call as a second order discipline now that's a fancy phrase for saying a sub a subject about subjects mm, the meta. Right. so where biology investigates um the maybe life and the world around us right and in that in that sort of domain philosophy investigates in the things that investigate mm -hmm. so we investigate science we investigate math right the math you know is a there's a methodology to it there's a methodology of biology physics psychology even and sociology and yeah, we're, we're over here saying, okay, we're a subject about you guys in a way. Right. And that's kind of where, um, you know, why I think this is a happy union between us, right. Where I, um, we're, we're analyzing, we're investigating the invest uh, the biology being an investigation of life. Right. Well, I, th I think you could make the argument too, that, I mean, philosophy kind of underpins every discipline in the sense that it's what kind of questions are we actually trying to ask? And philosophy is kind of what helps us suss out what what the um, kind of what the soft bounds of the subject really are. Because um, I mean, bio biology, biology, biology is is very simply put the study of life. Um, and as you mentioned, it does indeed involve. Okay, well, shoot, what is life, and what studies of life can be applied to biology. Um, it would, it would the statistics of biology count as biology? Um, it depends on who you ask, but I mean, that's what we have the, the philosophers for. And um, 
I think that, you know, Sellers, not Sellers, sorry, Godfrey Smith put it very interesting, put it in an interesting uh, kind of frame in the text, in Godfrey Smith's text, which is that kind of philosophy incubates these ideas in biology prior to actually being able to test them. So you are inherently doing philosophy when you're conceptually working through the theories of biology prior to putting them into a, a, an empirical sense, a, a way to kind of measure it with numbers uh, or even categorically. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, there are certain disciplines of, of philosophy. Like when I, for, let's take something like philosophy with mind. I'm like, what the heck kind of questions come up there? Isn't that like a thing for, for psychology and neurology or like philosophy, mathematics, what sorts of questions do we ask? Well, what sorts of questions do we ask for philosophy, biology? Well, life is a big question. What is that? Right. But we're going to kind of give you a preview of like um, if, for future videos, what we might, some of the questions that are raised in philosophy of biology. So the, what is, what's life? What's an, what's an organism? What's an individual that is studied by the biological sciences, right? Um, that's one, one big one, right? Yeah. Um, stuff like, uh, you know, uh, what is a gene, right? Like those sorts of things, like how to, um, genet you know, the, I don't know, I think genetics was, this was, um, they weren't called genes, they were called factors by Mendel. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, because yeah. Mendel's, and traits too, almost interchangeably. Because the thing, the thing that's interesting is like, okay, there, there's, as a side note to, to kind of delve into what, what we're going to be kind of parsing out and teasing apart. It's like, a, what a gene is in an empirical sense had to first be underpinned by what a gene is in a philosophical sense, right? Like these two things have to be kind of um, stated up front because life does get very messy. I mean, asking these kinds of questions and, and setting out the criteria ahead of time almost helps future proof a little bit because biology and life tends to do things where they operate in gradients. And without the philosophical underpinnings there, it's going to be very difficult to categorize things, which is kind of what biology seeks to do in a sense, because categorization allows for analysis. It allows for a deeper understanding. Yeah, and with respect, biology has a unique, um, I, don't want, I don't want to say issue, but like a, a unique question that maybe physics doesn't address. Maybe chemistry also has this question. But like where physics, you might want to say that physics is like this, I mean, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a scientist, right? But um, the idea of like a fundamental particle and its behavior, physicists are really interested in that question, right? But with biology and chemistry, these, if there is, if that's, a, if there's such a thing like a fundamental particle, what's happening is that um, there are things that are composed of parts, right? You're not really dealing with a, uh, the behavior of a fundamental thing. You're dealing with a composite, right? And so there's a big question about, okay, something like, uh, like a gene, right? or a molecule like insulin, right? What is insulin, right? Is insulin something that just is um, reducible to its parts to where you can almost like eliminate it? We shouldn't really be talking about insulin. We should be talking about these microstructures and these fancy things. Or is it actually something that's new in the world once these fundamental particles assemble in a way where you have that formation, right? So, you know, you have very interesting questions in biology and um, about like uh, these sorts of structures like um uh, what are the, like the four macromolecules, right? That's a, um, we, what, what are the, help me out here. Carbohydrates, lipids, yep. um, proteins and nucleic acids, yep. right? You didn't need my help. <laughs> well, uh, but those four, right. Um, you know, we, we, like you were talking about categorization, right? There might be a question about, well, are these categories as real as like the category of the fundamental particle that, that physicists are interested in? Yep. Right. And that's a really cool question, right? Um, well, you get, but, uh, you ruffle some serious feathers when you apply that to something called the biological species concept, which I know you're familiar mm -hmm. with. I mean, species, uh, the categorization, even when we're using like classical taxonomy, you start to get into some really interesting questions about where we draw the line and why we draw it there. Can it even be drawn in an objective sense? And that's when you start to make a lot of uh, biologists very angry because <laughs> actually uncomfortable at the least right yeah, yeah. Like getting to the bottom of that and and whether the biological species concept which is certainly in some aspects useful but whether or not it's appropriate is a completely different question to ask and right i think the the point that we're that eric and i are driving at is that 
there, there, there are the, these broader questions, right, in the philosophy of science that really have an impact on the philosophy of bi- biology. So inevitably, we'll be um, talking about some of the broader issues in philosophy of science, right? Um, but that being said, with a focus on biology. So right. your, you know, your, our philosophy of science is very integral here in terms of how we understand philosophy of biology, physics, and um, chemistry, if you take those. I mean, I, I don't know if they're... Uh, any more? I guess is quantum theory is under. Yeah, you can start physics. breaking them down, and you get into. Some yeah, you can break. Yeah, some but um, all very interesting. Um, one other question that we might ask in philosophy of biology is a very, well, in my opinion, I'm not going to try to give my opinion all the time here, but in my opinion, one of the most interesting questions: um, purpose and function in biology. <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah. that is. A, a really, really fun topic. It, it it does have cultural implications. You know, have you have a lot of the um, creationist and ID theorists coming out of the woodwork here, mm. and appeal to notions of function and uh, purpose in, as as something that supports their framework. And that, to me, whether you agree or disagree, is an interesting claim. Okay, and we're going to definitely entertain that and analyze that in, in a serious way. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I should that, be done regardless of the perspective you're coming from. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, the nature of science, whether you're dealing in biology or any of the other fields, is is to suss out truth and to suss out um, and truth as we perceive it, as we see it, and almost more importantly, again, depending on who you ask, how that truth becomes applicable to our lives. Uh, and and function happens to be one of those. Function when you're dealing with the genome and when you're dealing with uh, even specific genes starts to get into a very interesting business because it affects things like our health and medicine. Um, right, yeah. And um, I think the idea here is also that purpose and function seem to be, well, like when we ask what the what is the function of an electron, that might be weird semantically. It sounds kind of weird, but what is the function of insulin? Sounds like there's something a little bit that we're adding to the word when we're talking about something like insulin versus what are the function. For electrons don't have function. They just do things, right? They behave in regular ways considering their electrical charge and such, right? But insulin, we want to say in biology, we have to make sense of this word function and purpose because we, we attribute and predicate that that term to things in biology that you don't really see in chemistry and physics, which makes biology really cool, you know, I think, um, and a very unique um, science comparatively, right? Um, it, it absolutely is. And and I think, too, uh, kind of alluding, you know, digging in a little bit more there, I guess you would say, is this idea of, of naturally uh, developed function versus kind of applied function, something that humans can create a new function um for a given property. So yeah, the snake venom, well, what is the purpose of snake venom? Well, it can be defense for the snake. Uh, it could be predation. It can help the snake in its ability to predate on other animals. But we can use snake venom in an entirely new way, which is to say we develop anti-venom with it uh, or clotting agents in, in other cases. So it's like giving yeah. it a new function too, kind of muddies the waters as to what function is and why it's so important to get into, uh, which gets back to the whole, well, it depends on which category of function you're looking at and it's beautiful and messy and great (laughs) and i will say that um that you have a spectrum of thought here um at least in philosophy of biology and philosophy of science i don't know i can't speak for the biologist okay um there are a whole range of views about what function is for instance i think i think is uh dr nicholson um takes function to be what we call a normative notion which is to say that we're expressing goodness, badness, uh, what should happen, okay? Something but then you got people on the opposite side, and he's not a creation. I think, I, I, to my knowledge, he's not, a, he's not a theist, okay? And then we have people on the opposite side that say, hey, function, we should get rid of the word, mm. right? We should be talking like the chemist and like the physicist, right? right. So it's a, there's like a broad array of views here with respect to this issue, right? Um. Let's move on to, uh, because we do have other stuff to, to, to discuss um, apart from the sorts of questions we might ask in biology, but we'll be addressing stuff like, um, is there human nature? You know, um, I think um, Godfrey Smith mentioned, he distinguishes like philosophy of science from philosophy of nature. Yeah. And that's an interesting distinction. I don't see it that often, but the idea is that we, I think the way that he understands philosophy of biology or biology itself rather is to be more of a methodology or an instrument, I should say, to get at how nature is. Right. Okay, so 
right? And, um, and that's that's very that can be very um, troublesome almost because it's like determining what it is that science or data is telling us depends on kind of how your science works, what you determine science to be, uh, and and how you determine uh, objectivity with both data and then subsequently with its um, with its interpretation and analysis or analysis and interpretation rather. Yeah. So with respect to like humans, do we? Um, you know, there's like this question about whether we have a nature or like whether we're like kind of, I mean, I think the way that Godfrey Smith puts it is a, it's an open question in the, in the first part of his writing that do we even have a nature, right? Is there, uh, is that something that if, if, we, if we don't have a nature, then actually it's not to study, you know, there's not, the biology wouldn't be, wouldn't address such a thing, right? It, obviously, right. That it obviously follows that a um, biology doesn't really care because it doesn't exist. But if we have a human nature, that's something that biology is interested in, right? Yeah, um, humans, but, being, humans being a part of nature, certainly. And and the mm -hmm. follow up question that you would have, of course, would be: If humans have a nature, do other organisms? And how does that work? Is it is it kind of grouped and restricted, or is it a, a smooth gradient as much of life tends to be? Mm -hmm. And lastly, I mean, there are a lot of things to, to to question biology. I think this is the last big one too um, that I find rather interesting is the nature of, or I shouldn't use nature given how we just find it, but like the, what is information? Yeah. What is communication? Okay. Very, very tough questions, right? If anybody wants to see how difficult it is to get at this notion of information, just go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, put in information and you will not get a straight answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you will not get a straight answer. Uh, but, uh, there, you know, there are different kinds of information perhaps. Um, and this also factors into communication, right? Um, we're communicating, right? Um, are dolphins communicating, right? Um, that's, a, I think that might be a question that the biologist is interested in at least. It is. Um, I think, yeah. And I know that like someone like Noam Chomsky distinguishes communication from something like signaling. Or verbalization. Right. I mean, there's there's this whole concept of a, of a information, well, not information with communication that you've got a sender and you've got a receiver, and you're transmitting some kind of message, right? And at some point, right, as humans, we tend to suppose that that transforms from the state of like pheromone communication or vocalization, uh, pheromone communication rather in insects and vocalization and kind of more basal animals. And it eventually becomes communication when you reach some sort of higher level of animal. Where's that mm -hmm. line? What does that line look like? Why is the line there? Can it even be drawn? I mean, that to me, that's this consistent question in biology is why do we draw the lines where we draw them in order to create these categories? And if the lines can't be drawn, are the categories not arbitrary? And that becomes this this consistent theme, at least in, in what I see, whether we're dealing in the likes of evolution or whether we're looking at something um, more more microscopic in the sense of looking at genetics. So it's it, it becomes a very interesting kind of streamline of questions. And I don't know that it's standardized. Like, I don't know, as you mentioned, like in different people use mm -hmm. these terms in different ways and different people draw these lines in different places. Right. And this is a job for those that want to think about the concept of communication. What are we talking about? So this is a job of a philosopher or the biologist that wants to do philosophy for biology to ask, what is communication? How do we differentiate from it from non-communication or sig something like signaling? Right. And you've, you've, you've um, brought up a big one too. <clears throat> of course, philosophy, uh, biologists are interested in evolution and natural selection. And so are philosophers of biologists. Very, very integral in biology. It's, um, there's a, I mean, uh, there is actually um, a question about how do theories and laws work in biology. It seems like they work a little bit differently than in physics and maybe chemistry. Um, I mean, I, I think there's a philosopher of science named Alex Rosenberg. Um, he debated William Lane Craig, for those that are interested in philosophy of religion. Um, he thinks that there's only one law or theory in biology, and that's the theory of natural selection. Others don't think that. They think that they consider um, things like Mendel's law. Um, of heritability and the like, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, of course, someone like Rosenberg has definitely considered these sorts of things, but for some reason has um, omitted them from the category of biological theory or law. Yeah. What, you know, we, we, we here, Eric and I want to understand these motivations, 
Okay. Well, and, and to, to kind of parse the contentious nature of it out and just look at what the questions are and kind of how we how it is that we consider them. I think that that's really important. And it, this kind of makes for a nice segue into sort of the history of this line of thinking. Uh, because, you know, being this being a conversation about the philosophy of biology means that you really can't get around talking about evolution, evolution being this this foundational truth of biology, this idea that organisms change over time isn't new. People tend to look at it and say, ah, you know what? I mean, like Darwin did it. He was like common descent and natural selection. And then he kind of went like this and let science run with it. Uh, right. It started with the, the pre-Socratics. Empedocles yeah. um, was a pre-Socratic. Um, I think I could be wrong on the date, so someone can fact check me, but I think it's 400 BCE. Yeah. 430. Okay. Yeah, um, my cheat sheet. Oh, perfect. I don't, I don't have it in front of me right now, but uh, yeah. So, you know, this guy, I mean, what, what, what he took a view that uh, maybe you can characterize it better than me um, where like, there are these like parts of organisms that kind of find themselves together. Right. Not exactly evolution. I don't think most people would credit him with an evolutionary idea, but it sounds very similar. The idea is that like, um, there's a gradualness to our, 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 our the whole organism. Well, right? not just that, but he's got this idea, I mean, you characterized it quite well, that the parts of these organisms are sort of limping about, an arm here, you know, a leg there, eyeballs, a, a tongue, I don't know, teeth, which is actually like, pretty Lovecraftian when you think about it, it's kind of horrific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this idea that these... That these a tentacle these, there, you know. <laughs> yeah, these, these busy, you know, an elder horror over there. But the, the idea that these things are finding themselves and combining into these larger scale organisms is is of course, as Danny said, this idea of gradualism, but almost more importantly, I would propose is this idea that Empedocles proposed where the bad combinations are weeded out. They don't survive. The poor combinations are selected against as, as the later knowledge or later kind of um, uh, um, terminology would come to describe it. And, uh, you know, because he's got this idea that, of course, you know, if you just have an eyeball kind of seated on top of a leg, this organism combination isn't going to work so it's going to not survive a very very basal version of survival of the fittest from 430 bce which is really interesting. yeah and and a side note to, to empedocles he's the guy that um that people attribute to coming up with the four elements uh, yeah. you know for my last airbender people yeah, huh. uh, water fire earth all that i think they, they called them roots though i think there was a different term that's, we called them some, roots. some serious uh fire nation propaganda leaving right <laughs> the, 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 the <laughs> which which brings us to plato and aristotle now once again there most people would say they don't paint an evolutionary picture yet but once again you have similar themes so um, Aristotle, for instance, had this like sc scale, not like, I, I don't know how to say it in the Latin, but it, it, tra it, it translates to something like natural scale. Mm. Okay. Where <clears throat> you had the, you know, more basic organisms um, and the bottom. So like you had plants or whatever, and then you had, um, you know, animals and then man, and then he did include angels and God. Mm. Okay. But the interesting thing here is that he thought they were connected in some kind of way and ordered. Okay. He did. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and, he, and so, drew, he drew this very interesting line of, of the basal to the complex, and I, you know, it's kind of interesting that he didn't draw an ancestry line there. So he had the categorization, but it lacked the time scale. Right, and it, it, it was very influential. Um, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not too sure about this, but you know, if you, I think uh, Descartes, Rene Descartes, uh, the French. Um, modern philosopher in the early 1600s um, had something similar called a chain of being. Mm. Um, so, you know, you have, you have this kind of theme of, of, of natural scale or uh, complexity and this kind of connectedness, um, which brings us to Linnaeus, right? Father's taxonomy. Yeah. So we have, um, is this one of the, now you, you, you're going to be more of an expert on Linnaeus than I am presumably, but, um, is this our first um, recorded uh, effort in making a formal system for? Um, yeah, for, for classifying organisms, he's generally understood to be the, 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 the OG, right? Like he's coming out and he's saying, all right, um, we've got these organisms and we can put them into these related groups and categorize them in a sense that we can understand them better. And, you know, 
very, very interestingly, you know, he, he was a, a young earth creationist, and yet he found it very difficult to place humans, you know, outside of the other animals. He could find no reason why we shouldn't consider humans alone with the other living organisms, and in fact, he placed them with um, with the other with the other apes uh, upon seeing their skeletons all together. And I, I, his his quote is, I, I it kind of tickles me a little bit because he. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he was like, yeah, I can think of no reason by which not to lump man with simian or simian with man. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, sh I should find one lest I bring all of the theologians down upon my head. And he's like, and maybe I should just by the nature of the discipline. Um, and I think he. Yeah, that's where. Oh, well, go ahead, please. Yeah. Oh, man, there's a term for this um, and it's really going to bother me. But uh, what you're a, sort of talking about is that there's this dichotomy and that started with um you know the the ancient philosophers that there's this dichotomy between man and beast mm. you know that um where man is one of reason and beast is in terms is understood in terms of uh, drives and instincts and passions okay so there's like this um very strong dividing line and so what you what you said there seems to suggest that as we get closer to the modern era, we get we see that line get a little blurry all of a sudden, right? Um, and, 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 you know. and it's partially because, as you mentioned, you know, the separation between man and beast tended to be this ability to reason. But Linnaeus wanted to use specifically uh, physical characteristics. He wanted to use morphology, body and form to categorize animals. Uh, and of course, being our body is is just made of made of you know chemicals and, and other bits and bobs that that compose our, our physiology it became quite problematic it, it's it, reason is not something that's very tangible uh which is why yeah. by linnaean taxonomy it became quite hard to separate humans out right right and so and then well we have darwin in what in the 19th century right but in but a lot of people um in the in the 18th century started i mean like Darwin's grandfather, right? I think his name was Erasmus, and not to be confused with the the um, the humanist Erasmus. Yeah. I think, um, but uh, when I first read it, I um, I thought I was alluding to the Erasmus from the Renaissance uh, era, um, but or maybe it was a little bit before the Renaissance. I'm not so sure, but uh, yeah, there, Darwin had a grandfather, Erasmus, and started coming up with like you know um, evolutionary uh, um, ideas. Well, unless we sleep on Lamarck, I mean, Lamarckian evolution was a whole thing in and of itself. You know, he had this idea that there is an inheritance of acquired characteristics. So the way that these traits are passed down is if the parent acquired them previously. So you have that classic example of the of the giraffe that stretches his neck up to munch on some of the leaves. And if he stretches it and stretches it and stretches it enough during his lifetime, um, he'll be able to pass on that longer neck to his offspring. Um, which something like use is, use is very important in the Linnaean, uh, not the uh, Lamarckian yeah. framework, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and this, but I think he was, the Lamarck started publishing stuff in the early 1800s, but you had like people in like the 1750s, like uh, there's this, um, uh, there's, Fr there's this French Enlightenment uh, philosopher Diderot, who's pretty famous. Um, but, uh, you know, he started having these sort of ideas of like that that Darwin's grandfather had, and um, other f um, evolutionary ideas. And I think he was thrown in prison. Um, I'm not so sure exactly. Maybe if you remember, I think it had to do with fil this notion of filament. Do you, do you have more to say about that? Yeah, it's, it it gets it gets at it a little bit, but it tends to not be so focused on this this idea that was pending and kind of moving under the surface of organisms and how they change. Um, the, the, the filament was a bit tangential to that, I think. Okay. But the idea is that you had Lamarck, right? And then, but, but you had all these thinkers before him that started to think like, like in evolutionary ways. Mm. Right. And then mm. of course we get to, um, Mr. Darwin. Right? Yeah, Charles. Yeah. Charles Darwin. He's, he's got such an interesting history in and of himself. You know, I mean, he's, he's this guy who originally wants to be a surgeon and then he finds out he's very squeamish. Uh, so instead he says, all right, well, you know, maybe I'll, I'll do the, the, the pastor route and do the theology thing. And kind of on a whim, you know, he, he gets, he's very interested in Paley, which I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on in a bit. Uh, 
but kind of mm. on a whim, he takes this gig as a naturalist, just traveling on the Beagle, you know, around the world and documenting life and, and looking at how it changed. And the, the very kind of cornerstone of this too, <clears throat> is that Charles Lyell had just come out with uh, the, the, the foundations of geology, these ideas of uniformitarianism that things that we observe today probably happened at similar paces throughout time. And that kind of gave a very ancient uh, tag to the earth. And Darwin thought to himself, you know, okay, this is happening to rocks. Who's to say that it isn't happening to organisms? Um, and there were two other, you know, very influential ideas that would underpin evolution by natural selection. Uh, and and if you want to tell us a bit about Paley and, and kind of how that impacted him, and as well yeah. as well, both of them. So there's this, you know, there's this huge, you know, um, the, what do you call it? A uh, tension between um, intelligent design and evolutionary theory. But I will say that Darwin did not hand wave intelligent design. No. He was actually really interested in it. Okay. He respected William Palin. Okay. He read his work. Okay. Make sure he understood what he had to say before he dismissed it. Okay. But ultimately, he was unpersuaded by Palin. Okay. Mainly because he would see sort of these horrific things in nature that didn't seem to cohere well with an omni god. That's to say, a god that was all good, all powerful, and all knowing. Okay. Um, what, well, like a good example, um, what is, I think the wasp in the worm, is it the caterpillar? Yeah. Can you, the what, is, what happens there? The wasp. Yeah, Darwin is very wigged out, properly so, by this concept of, of parasitoid wasps. So there's this very elegant way of reproducing, uh, not for the squeamish, ironic coming from Darwin, but there's this very uh, elegant and disturbing, unsettling way that, that some solitary wasps reproduce. Uh, and it's known as, uh, you know, everyone knows parasitism, but then there's parasitoid wasps, which actually parasitize in their means of reproduction. So they'll fly up to a caterpillar, um, or sometimes they're these, you know, bark termites and the like, uh, or, or bark beetles that live under the bark of trees. And uh, they sting, they sting the organism until it's paralyzed. And then lay their eggs either on the surface or the back of the organism, or sometimes they there have been more uh, precise way of doing it where they actually inject the eggs into the organism, uh, which so depending on <laughs> depending on whether you're the wasp or the beetle can be a more uh, a more foolproof way of ensuring that your offspring make it to to actually hatching. And essentially, as the the babies hatch, be it on the back of the bug, a back of the back of the insect. Uh, or, or grub, or on the inside, they, they slowly consume it. And, um, and eventually, once they're large enough, and, uh, large enough and have consumed enough of their host, they flutter on to go do the same thing to, to more to more other insects. And um, of course, yes. this is an incredibly <laughs> intelligently designed, if you really want to look at how, how efficient it is. Uh, but, but Darwin kind of thought, okay, well, you know, if God is omnibenevolent and nature is red in tooth and claw, it seems to be a nature design, uh, if anyone's getting at it, you know. Right. I mean, like this is the the problem of animal suffering seemed to be a problem for Darwin um, enough to where Paley was um, not very convincing, but well, very interesting. Of suffering, you know, it was these incredibly elaborate, um, very grotesque in his mind ways of suffering that were just a little bit like almost overkill right like yeah it didn't have to be yeah. that gruesome and yet here here we were so he was influenced by i think charles is it Char charles um lyle right is that how you pronounce lyle. it yep. okay lyle. and then uh william paley he was influenced by william paley um heavily respected him hmm. and hmm. also thomas malthus now Malthus had this idea that there's this kind of like struggle for life, right? So here we have something like the survival of the fittest kind of um, emerge from, from Malthus's ideas, right? So these three are, um, you know, uh, Darwin um, credits them, right? Or the, he owes a lot to these three think thinkers in terms of how his, his views developed. To, with respect to evolutionary biology at the time, right? But it's very interesting, right, to see the history. And I think that helps us do some of the philosophy of biology in terms of how we got from, you know, the different philosophical views um, changed and the views of biology changed through time. And so it's, it's, it's interesting. Right, um, yeah, it's, it's, 
it, it almost was this perfect storm for, for evolution by natural selection to come about because you've got the slow change over time uh, coming from Lyle. And then you've got this idea of kind of natural selection, right? Because Paley had this idea of a natural theology. So it's kind of this perfection over time, perfection slowly developing over time, even though his time frame was obviously much smaller. And that's sort of like your natural selection, your survival of the fittest, your, your traits being culled from the population under circumstances that aren't advantageous for them. And then, of course, through Malthus, you've got the, the red and tooth and claw, the struggle for life, as mm -hmm. you alluded to. And all of this kind of goes into evolution by natural selection. And common ancestry was sort of a, a natural consequence of that, because as you move backwards in time, the changes begin to disappear and the organisms converge until you have a common ancestor of all life. And from Darwin's perspective, there was no reason to draw a line in the sand anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, I, I would assert that there, that there still isn't. Um, genetics kind of would come to bolster that because, you know, you've got Darwin doing this and just strolling around on the beagle and then in a monastery somewhere, Greg Mandel is breeding his pea plants and he's coming to realize that there are indeed these, tra these traits that exist that are passed on. Um, and, and there's something that inter interesting that uh, Godfrey Smith mentions. Um, he kind of presents Darwin's, um, for lack of a better phrase, intellectual integrity here or... Um, you know, it, it, epistemic responsible. He was epistemically responsible. Previous to Darwin, who I think I briefly mentioned that you had these things called filaments or these kind of think of like a primordial soup in which you know was the explanatory mechanism for all life. Like everything came out of like a pot or something like a, a pot of goo. Um, Darwin rejected that, um, and not because he thought it was false necessarily, because he did he didn't see the evidence going one way or another. This is to say that Darwin entertained the idea of there being multiple trees of evolutionary trees. Commonly, we think of one, you know, one tree, and that might be, I think that's the current sort of model that we have now, but he didn't go, jump straight to that, right? He, he entertained the idea that there could have been multiple sort of, for lack of a better phrase, a spontaneous generation events. Um, he, he, I believe, oh gosh, I can't remember where he kind of um, gestured to, to lines kind of initially on his musings. But, you know, they, obviously it was quite easy to look at <clears throat> to look at life and say, all right, well, probably all animals are related. Like I can get behind that. And then you might say, well, the plants are pretty, plants are pretty different though. Right. So maybe the plants are, are something a bit separate. Mm -hmm. What about the funguses? Maybe, maybe they're also unique. Um, and, you know, we're starting to get into microbiology as well, too, where everyone was like, all right, well, you know, if everything comes from a common ancestor, well, why did some things stay so small? And this tends to be like the why are there still monkeys argument from from folks who are very interested in, in evolutionary theory. But then you have to step back and say, well, how many humans are there versus how many bacteria are there? Right. It depends on how you measure success. And this idea of fitness of reproductive success also acted as, of course, the cornerstone to evolutionary theory. How do you pass on your genes? How successful are you at it? And and how do we how do we decide what success looks like? Yeah, and and to add to the history here, to add to the story, um, according to Smith, um, evolution was actually like the you know just if we understand it in, in terms of, of, of its broad sense was pretty much accepted by scientists. Um, what was controversial was the mechanism. Okay. Right. Yeah. It, it, in right. fact, it was so it was so elegant when it was first proposed. There was this almost palpable from the scientific community, like, "Duh! Why didn't we think of that?" You know, it, it, it seemed so intuitive. And common ancestry really wasn't all that troublesome either. Like, it, mm -hmm. most of the scientists, even the even the theologians, understood from from Linnaeus onward uh, that, that you know, humans are animals and of course, if animals change over time, well, then God must have imposed this mechanism. You know, th this wasn't problematic really until like the Seventh Day Adventists came on the scene in like the early 1900s. Uh, mm -hmm. And up until that point, everyone was pretty on board. Like you said, it was mostly just okay, but how does it occur, right? What are the mechanisms behind it? How many are there? Can can natural selection really do it all? And and we're going to kind of, I'm sure, talk about that at some point as well. Yeah, and I want to say that there were ab there were abuses, especially in the um, the Gilded Age, right? Of the, um, of, of what Darwin was saying, I think he directly addresses it um, in the Descent of Man. I think he, that's one of Dar published work. But 
stuff like social Darwinism did come up, right? And and that that's interesting because it showed that it was influential, oh, yeah. right? Uh, it was very influential. Well, that you, you get these interesting dichotomies where in in the likes of World War Two, with where social Darwinism was was heavily abused and exploited, but then they're also burning copies of Origin of the Species, right? Um, and and you know the 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 kind of there's kind of a murkiness to like the overall impact of, of you know evolutionary theory as to how much it was accepted kind of from from the the axis powers I suppose and that's kind of like a classic trope that goes around like oh Dar- Darwinism caused Darwinism caused World War II and and the aspects of it but Darwin was as an individual stark abolitionist and in the Descent of Man while he does use some kind of outdated and troublesome terminology that has come to have been shown to be uh, kind of useless. Um, like for instance, the the idea that race has a basis in biology gets gets very strange. I mean, Klein's tends to be the more accepted idea, just because people tend to interbreed in strange ways. Um, but yeah, he he was a very big proponent of this idea of the unification of humans, of of existing humans, um, and that I think that tends to get lost lost in the mix of things when when modern when modern folks kind of look at him and address him because of how influential social Darwinism was. It sucks mm-hmm. that his name got pinned to that, you know? Yeah. It, 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 I think that if you're interested, if you really are interested in Darwin, definitely read The Descent of Man. That's a pretty good philosophical work. It's not, um, so if you're a scientist and you like philosophy, read Descent of Man. Highly recommend it. Yeah. It's um, very, very it, interesting as a text. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, maybe towards the end of our video series, uh, we'll, we're going to, you know, we'll do an episode on race realism, because I think that is something that biologists do, um, appro- you know, they approach that topic. Yeah. Uh, it's not like, it's, you know, it's, it's necessary to approach it and to address it. I mean, I think that you run into some, some strange issues when it comes to like, okay, well, what, what do biologists have a responsibility to talk about? Because there tends to be this idea that it's like, oh, if you know, if biology doesn't touch it, that there's an aspect of like uh, hiddenness, and people tend to try and impose conspiracy on it, or you know, say, well, they're only, they're only talking about it because they know it's true, or something along those lines. Right, and I do want to, I do want to, um, uh, I guess, make sure that there's a difference between um, I myself am not a race realist, okay, no. but there is a difference between race realism and being a racist because. Some people do think that race is like a real category in in biology or nature, okay? But they think they're all equal in some kind of way. Um, so I think the idea of a racist is that there's some kind of superiority or inferiority in, um, with respect to the different re- races that are real, right? That um, does, so that's a that does tend to be um, kind of inferred. There. I yeah. Think that- right. No, there's a strong correlation. A lot of race realists that I meet that label themselves as race realists that strongly correlates with with you know white supremacy and such. But the point is, is that there are people like if you you know I have students and you know if I ask them, do you think that there is a black race, you know, or something like that? Um, uh, you know, you it wouldn't be surprised to say if they said, yeah, of course, race. You know, there are black people in the world, right? Um. And I think there's still an intelligible way of, of meaning that and saying that that's true. It's just not going to be um, understood. The truth conditions for that are not going to be perhaps the same sorts of truth conditions you'll have as there is insulin. Um, yeah, and, and culture tends to play a huge role there. I mean, people people also tend to get into that when it comes to uh, discussing things like uh, the difference between gender and sex. That tends mm-hmm. to be something that also gets broached a lot, and it's important to understand what people are talking about. It's important to define our terms when we're discussing these things because they have huge implications on people's lives. Um, and and knowing what what we are actually talking about is like half the battle. It almost feels like because people tend to misappropriate uh, terms from biology in order to find a means to a certain ends, um, to a certain end rather. And it's the responsibility I think of biologists to responsibly discuss these kinds of things uh, so that when mm-hmm. they do disseminate out into the public, people know what they're actually talking about when they use certain words. And, certain and this goes back to our question about what is an individual in biology? Um, you know, so heavily pertains to how your notions of sex, gender, and race. Um, so that, that'll be an interesting chapter or section of the book to, to, to yeah, discuss, yeah, it's, but um, which brings us to uh, an interesting question 
um, historical development was that when Mendel came out with his factors, which later on to, turned to be some kind of alleles, or, or am, I, am I right about that? What's the technical term for factor nowadays? Yeah, but, I, mean, I, I don't I don't necessarily know what Mendel, I'm not familiar enough with Mendel's kind of terminology to get at it, but yeah, you could you could go with alleles. It depends on kind of okay. the level that you're speaking at. Well, what's really interesting is that people thought that Mendel's work contradicted Darwin's work. And I think it was actually pretty interesting reasoning. Um, the idea is that when you take something like a, a pea plant, um, you know, you notice these um, generations, you know, you have the F1 generation, F2 generation. As you go on, you start to see a consistent pattern and the percentages, the, um, the proportions of, of traits are regular, right? They don't change. Yeah. But the whole idea of, you know, Darwin's views is that things change, right? I mean, there's these, um, you know, later on we, we, we think about mutations, but that, but, you know, during Mendel's time and certainly Darwin's time, we didn't, we didn't know about mutations or genes or DNA or anything like that. Yeah. So there was an initial tension, like, Hey, look, if you look at all these generations across, you know, with these pea plants, you see no changes in the, in the percentages, the ratios of the, of, of the F generation. Yeah. You start to right? get this idea of a fixity of traits. Like there are a set amount of traits that can be kind of picked from, but outside of that, you're not going to see an introduction of anything new, uh, which you're right would, would propose, like would pose a very interesting challenge, especially at the time for, for, for Darwin and for those who are, um, kind of following along with, with evolution by natural selection. It, you're, it's not until you get this idea of, okay, well, can new information, quote unquote, be introduced? And if so, how is it introduced? And then right. you get into the messiness of, well, what is new information? Is it new information if you're simply tweaking something that previously existed? It adds a different, depends on who you ask, <laughs> as usual, you know? I mean, if that's the classic and issue. A, a quick side note, I think F generation, does that stand, the F there is for filial, is that right, filial, something like that? I don't know if you know. Yeah. Right, does that mean a family? Yeah, I, I was because I, for for people that don't know any biology, I take I I could be wrong. I'm mean, curious. Erica will correct me. I think F generation is the generation following a parent generation, right? Yeah. Is that is that okay? Yeah, um. That, so if if I I didn't explain what that that terminology was for any. So if you're a viewer now, you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. Um, I don't check because it's been a long time again since I've looked into like Mendel and like you know I know what it, obviously what F what F0, F1, like moving through the generations, what they are, but like what they stand for, it's been a while mm -hmm. for me too. Yeah, well, um, but then we get into a little bit of modern biology. Um, you know, we have, we, we went from Mendel, um, we get some of the implications for how, um, you know, like Watson and Crick, how these things happen. And of course that relates to this new discipline that emerged, the molecular biology, gen genetics and stuff. Um, in the, in the, in the mid to late 20th century, um, you know, um, so we'll be briefly, you know, looking at some of those implications and those ideas. Um, but yeah, um, well, if we want to. Synthesis has changed into the modern era, like as in where we currently live. I mean, it's, there's, there's been tweaking that's obviously still been occurring, but what, what remains very true is the foundational aspects of the theory of evolution and kind of how they're related to these other principles of biology, um, principles being used quite loosely. Right. So, I mean, for next time, we're going to be really analyzing um, laws, theories, and mechanisms um, with respect to biology. We did discuss that this might look a little different than what the what are those weird physicists and chemists are doing over there. Um, but um, that's going to be the concentration of our next video. Yeah, so yeah, these, these ideas of um, kind of straightening out what, what we, what we mean when we say talk when we're talking about mechanisms and laws and theories, because biology is somewhat unique in that there really aren't that many laws of biology as we kind of alluded to earlier. Uh, so why is that? And, and is a law in biology, the same thing as a law and kind of like your harder sciences, I guess. Um, which which is going to be very interesting. It's kind of this has been kind of a more general outline of like where we're going to go with this, um, because philosophy of biology is is so important and underappreciated. It's one of those things that everyone uses, especially those who, who are in the field of biology, but they don't necessarily know that they're using it. Uh, so it's good to have that foundation and, and know kind of where you're coming from. I think it gives a unique perspective and allows for a different way of looking at things as well that you may not have considered previously.
So, you got anything else to say? Do we want to touch on anything else before we kind of nip this one in the No, this is great. Um, thanks for having me on. If you're interested in some of my work, um, uh, I just started a YouTube channel. It's called Phil Talk. Uh, hopefully, Erica will put it in the description. I do other stuff as well. Um, also, if um, this is Erica, so this is her channel, so don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Yeah, like, and like the video. And subscribe. That's, that's, and hit the bell if you... <laughs> Hit the bell if you want the notifications, of course. You gotta, we gotta chill, we gotta channel chill here.